I'm a musician of Chinese flute. Uh, this is the Chinese flute. Actually, I also use this flute in the, this performance. Uh, I also use this uh, flute in the Anxing Theater of Davos last year in summer in the Anxing Greek drama. So this is something I'm trying to do. Also, Akisis has mentioned Evgenio Barbar, and I'm, we, we, we met him last year in Vlatikon here in, in Napoli. So he has been working in intercultural theater, and this is also one. This is also my interest because I'm from China. We also have Chinese theater, and we. Uh, and, but I'm interested in Greek theater, so that's why I'm studying here. And as I know, uh, I'm the first foreign student here. But also, in, even for the whole grade, there are very few Chinese students here studying Greek, uh, Greek theater. So, um, last October, I discussed with artists what I should do for my thesis. Tomorrow, I have my defense. So, we have been discussing a lot for the whole afternoon uh, in, in artists' home. And so, in the beginning, we thought, okay, we I found a school for language, for history, for music, for lit subject. But then I thought, Maybe I can do one thing very more difficult with the students from drama school. Because as I know, at least in China, drama in education is very rarely used for the professional actors. They think, okay, drama education is for kids, it's for children, it's not for, it's for the people, amateurs, and not for professional actors. But I think, okay, we would, we, I want to do an experiment to do this. But why I have this idea, because last year, uh, no, two years ago, in 2018, the National Theatre of Greece and National Theatre of China, they co-produced the one theatre performance, uh, Zhao the Author. It's also from an, a story from ancient China, and also it was the first Chinese play performed in Europe in 18th century. So, I watched that performance in National Theatre in, in, in Athens for two, two times. Uh, then I talked to the actors there uh, from the National Theatre that told me they have a problem. They worked for three months for that performance. They had rehearsals every day. They had one Chinese director and two group Chinese actors from China to work together. But then they found they have a problem that the director didn't teach them too many uh, uh, about Chinese culture. And it's a story from ancient China. They wear Chinese costumes, they perform a Chinese history. But they didn't understand why they act like that. But you know, after sometimes when directors told us what you should do, you just do it. You, we, but actors want to know why I do that. Why the role he has this reaction. So this is a problem in this interculture theater performance. Then I do, I did some research, trace back, for example, like for Evgenio Barber or Brecht. Or even even earlier in 18th century, there were some more actors and the directors that have done this in the country theater between Europe and, and Asia. But then I found basically nobody care about actors. They their efforts are mainly on the costumes, masks, the stage setup, the music, the lightings, or this appearance for act for audiences. So imagine you are audiences. When you go to watch a performance, you say, wow, this stage is Chinese, we have Chinese flags there. It's very Chinese, then you understand it's Chinese. So this is basically the first thing for the directors or stage setup to do for the audience is to understand this is the theater performance for interculture. But when the actors start to perform, so sometimes some audience will feel they'll have many questions. Why do they perform like that? Oh, why do you see the Greek actors wearing Chinese costumes? Because you know, sometimes for us it's very strange. Many of my friends say, wow, really, the Greeks are wearing Chinese traditional clothes. What will you like? Because, you know, in, in Forbidden City in Beijing, there are many foreign tourists. They're wearing Chinese costumes, take photos. Very strange, honestly. So that was their, their, their concern. So, what do, so today the topic will be about uh, intercultural theater. So what is an intercultural theater? We have definition here. The meeting in the moment of performance of two or more cultural tra traditions, a, a temporary fusing of styles and all techniques and all cultures. To be simple, the mix of two cultures. <coughs> I have heard artists also say the, 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 
the same, the two cultures that come to meet each other, so they mix with each other. But how to do it? That's the problem. Everyone knows. We are always saying, wow, Greek, Greek culture and Chinese culture, we are two ancient civilizations. We have many similarities. We have many things to do together. But how? So this is a, a problem. Also, to, uh, for your information, because since 2014, I have been working on the cultural exchange between China and Greece. So we have, a com uh, um, we have uh, finished more than uh, 50 projects between China and Greece. Music, sculpture, exhibition, many, uh, many projects. So I have some special understanding on this uh, issue. So that's why also I want to do it in cultural theater, because I think the cultural exchange also applies to theater. So we had a performance. It's called Farewell My Concubine. I was, it was originally a Beijing opera. And then it was first performed in China in, in uh, the 19th century. And then also it was performed by our uh, master of uh, Beijing opera, the Mei Lan Fang, in America. So it became also then in Europe, in Moscow. So, and like Greg, uh, Stenaplasti, and also this, some other directors, they also went there to, to Moscow to watch the performance. So, it was a Beijing opera, but it has very few being a theater performance. And it has never been performed in Greece. There was also a, a movie, the same title, Angio Kalagidan. So, we, we have made a trailer, so first I show you the trailer, how it was like. Uh, she's a lady, uh, 
Yeah. And also a big barber or peer group. All of them, but also there are many others, but these are famous ones. Yeah, basically what they do, they have adopted the theatre from Asia. And I found it very interesting that most of them they adopted the, the theatre from India. I don't know why. Maybe it's very exotic for you to see Indian theatre. So many of them they use the, the dish from India or from Thailand, some of them from China, also some of them from Japan. So they have done many, many uh, try, uh, tried, especially I, what I like is Greg. He even wrote a play called The Good Man of Sichuan. So that is a kind of a, a European direct, uh, playwright, a writer, writer story about China. So that is also I watched the, uh, one time in Athens, the Greek actor that performed that, that play. So it was very interesting to see that. But also, when I know all these cases, I had a, I had a question. How did these directors know about the other culture? For example, Emgino Babar told us he has been to India, he has been there to learn in the, in the theatres, so he adopted all of the elements to use in their theatres. This is one thing because as I, I have been working on the Greek culture and the Chinese culture exchange for, since 2014, it has been five years. But I can never say I really understand Greek. Even when you are saying, oh, Chinese culture, I'm always told my good friend, Chinese culture is not Chinese culture. It's not one culture. We are a huge country. In different regions, we have different cultures. Even as our Chinese people, <coughs> we don't really know Chinese culture. It's a huge thing. So even at Greek theater, it's a huge thing. We is not, oh, I know Greek theater. So this is something I'm confused. Because if for example, I, when I see the Greek, uh, ancient Greek drama, wow, I saw it's very fancy with people, very rich, or it's like a gods are here. So I adopt all the things to, to perform in China. I may make a mistake. I, 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 will, I will not be sure I, I understand correctly like you, like Greek people. So this is one thing is, I, I believe in the culture theatre or in culture projects, you need to really understand both cultures very well. Otherwise, you, you really make a mistake. That's why for us Chinese people, or for many times when we see the performances, especially movies, by the European or American directors about China, especially they have some Chinese roles in the movies, it's very strange for us. I always say, it's not Chinese, it's, they're not Chinese. But of course, they, most times they use Japanese or Vietnamese or Korean to perform the Chinese roles. And this is one thing is why well, how we to prevent not like confusing or when you are not when you don't really understand the one culture, but you want to do the culture exchange, how to do it? Actually it's very simple, just study. So for the European, you have been trying many things. But you know, here I just want one one thing to, to, to finish here. Chinese culture is not a mysterious. I don't like people, it's not I don't like, I'm not used to people where every time they see me that you... I'm not a, this is for Buddhism. It's not for all the Chinese people. Or sometimes that you like... <laughs> no, it's not for China. So you know, but for you to see why it's very interesting. Oh, Chinese culture is very mysterious. It's coming from Far East. It's very interesting for us. Yes, it's very interesting for all, everyone. It's also for us. But, that's... We need to know the, the authentic Chinese culture. This is, this is one thing really I, I'm keen on this. Also in Asia, we have many practices in, for the Intifada Theatre. The uh, very famous one, Suzuki, from Japan. Yeah, he has done all these three are performances of ancient group drama. So they use, for example, they use Japanese opera or Chinese opera to perform. For example, that's the Chinese opera, they are performing in the books. Also, in the Edgar this year, last year in Edgar we also see the Japanese uh, opera artist, the teacher, perform uh, Oedipus in with Kabuki. But then, okay, my confusion comes again. For example, 
in, for those performances, if we don't tell the audiences, this is Oedipus. Nobody will know it's Oedipus. It's basically like a Japanese couple They don't have words. So they don't say anything. They just do movements. So if you don't have a title there, Oedipus, or you don't know they are performing Oedipus, how can you know that? Also, the, we see the Japanese opera or Chinese opera. The most popular practice is they use the form of the vocal opera to perform an uh, ancient Greek drama play. This is the easiest way. This is what, um, as I said, um, I have done the culture change between China and Greece. Mainly, what I have done is the music, the concerts. So it's like I use a Greek, like a Buzuki or Baglama or Greek lyra to perform a Chinese song. Or I use a Chinese, like my Chinese flute or a Chinese guzheng or guqing instruments to perform a Greek song. This is the practice. So basically, I use one form to perform a foreign content. This is the basically the most of the practice now, till today, are uh, happening. And this is a very easy way. It's like a, a Greek actor wearing a Chinese costume. Or I wear, like the last year when we do the theater of Bromos, I perform Apollo. So I wear a tipola. So this is also I, will, I put an anti nuclear. Okay, I've become very brave. But I have a Chinese face. I have Chinese inside. How can I really be like Apollo? How can the Greek actors, like the main actor in the beginning, so how can he really be like the king of China? This is the thing we need to really think about. For example, here, okay, I'm wearing Chinese opera costumes, I'm performing Chinese opera, I'm performing a story of Oedipus. But how can I be Oedipus? This is the thing we need to really think about it. So, last year I also asked the professor from the University of Pondras, from the Department of Good Studies there, I, I asked why the Chinese operas performing the ancient Greek drama. I'm confused. He said, because this can be very popular in Greece because they perform a very familiar story for you but with an exotic form so you are sitting in Greece and you can see the performance from China a bathing opera but with a story you can easily understand but if they perform with a really, I mean pure bathing opera a bathing opera story it will be very difficult for you to understand like a, why they do this why the stories are like that and then you will have I mean, you need, to, you need to spend more time to think about the stories. But the Oedipus, you are too familiar with that. And then just change the form. So it can be very popular in Greece, but not, not in China. This is the fact. In China, it won't be popular because... First, the story is very difficult for us to understand. Even if you perform in ancient group drama, it's difficult for Chinese uh, audiences. Then you put it in the opera way. It's more difficult for us to understand. So also, we are very familiar with the opera form. Why do we still need to watch a opera form to perform a foreign play? So this is why it happens. So when the professor told me, I, I was, wow, yeah, this is the answer. Yeah, it's for great audiences to perform a play in opera of uh, Oedipus. So like also like Japanese Kabuki to perform Oedipus, or so I have a memo here. It will be very popular for you, and not in Japan or China. It's the same like here, if, if we in China we use the I mean, op opposite way, it also happens. So, why do we need intercultural theatre? So the first thing is, as I said, you are, we, we are interested in the foreign uh, forms. Like for you, oh, I'm interested to see how Beijing Opera is like. Also in China we have 300 types of operas. Beijing Opera is only one of the types, 300 types. So, People will say, oh, I want to see the other 300 forms of the uh, Chinese opera. Also, we have uh, many of the, especially the practices before I said that like Brecht or Edgar Barbar, why they do the intercultural theater? Because they found the problems in their, in their own theater. So they, they want to, 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 to adopt the elements from a foreign theater to solve their own problems in their own theater. This is more, the more important reason. But uh, from what we have seen in my research, the problems now we have seen in the cultural theater, first is the cultural shock. For example, the great actors, when they are putting in the Chinese theater performance, they will say, wow, 
Luckily, in my project, in the beginning, many of the actors told me, I don't know what to do. I have no clue. What, I, don't know, I don't know how should I think, how should I move, how, what should I say, in which way I can say. But, you know, in the beginning, many of them told me that. They are like, very stressed. So this is a culture shock. Uh, the real type is also one thing. You have your, for example, I don't know how many of you have been in China. All the group actors, the 16 group actors, they have never been to China. All their knowledge about China from the movies or the media. Nobody has seen the real China. This is, so, in this way, of course, they have the, some very strange impressions about China. So even when they see me, they say, oh, you are not like the Chinese I have ever seen. You are very Greek. I say, actually, I'm very Chinese. <laughs> so, you know, this is a, something. Also, the mixing of language. This is also very important. Uh, I noticed artists also said that we use both Greek and Chinese on stage. So, in short, they often did the same. But this has become a problem. For example, when you give your audiences, you see the Greek actors and Chinese actors on the stage. Chinese actors say Chinese to the Greek. The Greek answer was Greek. Why do they understand each other? Why? Yeah, the audience, everyone knows. All the audience or actors, everyone knows. The two actors are pretending they understand each other, but actually they don't. They just remember their lives. Right? So, this is one thing we need to solve. So, in our project, I will explain later how we solve this problem. The, the, the next one is a French. I don't know how to read it, but it's, it's about the stage setup. So, so basically, the, the, how we really make the scene. So, when in our stage setup, we try to make it simple. Because we don't really make a really a Chinese stage there. And localization of subjects, this is also one problem, but not in our case. Uh, this is for my thesis, but actually this is for tomorrow. So just for you to have a look. Tomorrow in my defense, I will use this part. These are from the actors, from my from my research project. What are the difficulties they have had? And what expect their expectations? So basically, in the, all of this, the most important, interesting for me is we want to create a new theater. So what we want to do is we are not performing a Greek theater. We are not performing a Chinese theater. We, are, we want to create a fusion of both. Then it becomes a new one. This is why I'm also saying. So for example, if I use the Beijing Opera to perform at uh, Egypt or at Amenno, it's still Chinese Opera. We didn't change the theater. I mean, the, 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 the real thing. We just perform a story. We can use any story for in, in this planning to perform with Beijing Opera or, or group, group theater. But when, in our case, you will see, we really make it different. We, we create a new theater. We cannot call it Chinese or Greek. So this is something really, for me, is interesting. So, in my case, of course, the first thing is the language. So, I first I give you the answer of how we solve the problem of the mixing of two languages. We use a translator. How we use a translator? For example, in this story, there are two countries, two kings. One is one country called the Chu, one country called the uh, Han. It's like an Athens and Sparta. So, when they meet each other, in China, we are huge. So, basically, even in, like in my hometown, in one city, we have five dialects. And in the five dialects, we don't understand each other. So it's like five countries. And the true and the high is from East China, West China, basically that for 100% for, for sure they don't understand each other, the, the dialects. They speak Chinese, but it's dialects, so they don't understand. So it's like China and Greece, so we put it like China and Greece. So the king of China and the king of Greece, we meet each other. How can we understand each other? Of course, I don't, I don't speak Greek, you don't speak Chinese. Then, the, Chinese, the king of China, of course, he speaks Chinese. The king of Greece speaks Greek. Then, for example, like our president visit in Greece, then the president will have a translator company. The other translator will speak. So, when, so in our performance, so when I speak, after I speak Chinese, the group actor don't pretend he understands. Of course, he doesn't understand. So, I will ask my translator to translate my, what I said to the, the other king. So, this makes sense. This also happened today. I think maybe in this 100 years it will still happen. 
if we have different languages. So this is one way we saw, but not enough. We are trying to make it even better. Um, also, the languages, in our case, we also ask the good actors to speak Chinese. Because language is, is the key, is the core of the culture. So through the language, they can understand the culture better. So I spent also some time to teach them Chinese. So for example, in this, I have a video from our performance. So in the performance, in the end of the performance, there was there is a poem. It's, all the Chinese people know this poem, it's very famous. And uh, I composed a, a melody for that, so if they can sing it. So all the act, great actors, like a great actor, they sing in Chinese. Something very powerful. 
very spe very special. In China, the mentality is okay. We are like we like the main actors. The, the others are all behind. They are, they are not important. The chorus is very important. They're always on stage. They make the whole performance. They make the the, the voice more loud. So from the beginning of our project, I insist to put the chorus in our performance. Though you can see they are even wearing Chinese costumes. The they are made for soldiers. They are even wearing the Chinese the opera masks. But still, we use the chorus, the Greek chorus inside. Is the, 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 the core in this part is Greek, and uh, artists have watched the performance. So you can see in the, in the, on the stage, it makes the whole performance very special. But uh, you don't feel very strange when the chorus suddenly come. You don't feel it's, it's adapted into the performance. So the chorus part is a uh, is one thing I think is very successful in this project. Okay. Jen, the maids and the soldiers. So they are like a, with the kings and the speaking, the telling. It's the same function as the good chorus. So they're telling the stories, also uh, telling the talking to the audience. Gesture and movement. This is also one thing in the beginning is becoming very difficult. Some people, you know, the directors told some actors say, "Don't be too great," because they they work like. <laughs> you cannot imagine this in a Chinese performance. So don't be, they say, so don't be too great. So now then we, we think, how can we help them to have the movement, gestures like Chinese? Of course, we, the performance, then in a, in a form of performance, people say we do the greetings like this. So this, everyone learns this, all the, gr the girls that do, that do like this. So all the, these are the greetings, but the, these are the, the, when they stop here, but the, when they move, also like a king. Also, like uh, soldiers or like Chinese uh, scholars, how they move, really move. So, what are we, how we solve this? For example, like this part, this is sword dancing. It's not a Greek sword dancing, like Spart Spart Spartans. It's a, it's a real Chinese uh, generals to how to do a sword dancing. So, what are, how we solve this problem is we use Chinese martial arts. So, every rehearsals and practices, we use exercises of Chinese martial arts. So, we we teach them to, to do the uh, tai chi, tai chi chuan. So this, in this way, they will have the real movements of, not only for boys actually, but also for girls. The girls have the group dance. So it really helps them to do the movements of the dancing. Costumes. These are also one thing very important. Actually, these police costumes are really, I fly back to Canada. I bring all the costumes here. So, um, these costumes, they are not real costumes actually, they are real clothes. They are the real clothes that we wear in ancient China. So it's not, not, not for performance this. This is what we wear in ancient China every day. So I also have my, my gear. So I can show you some of that. We have many, many types also through all the ages we have different types. So for example, we have basically we have two parts. This part is called the Yi, this part is called the Shang. So clothes in Chinese is Yi Shang. So the upper part and the lower part. And so for the upper part, but you can see, for example, like in, this wearing the, with the very big sleeves. This, uh, this is a very, more, more typical with a very big sleeves. Yeah, but we know, he, the actor is always um, complaining. I can't move with such big sleeves. How can I put my sword? How can I fight? It will be really very difficult for him. So in my questionnaire for him, hey, what is the biggest difficulty for you in this project? My big sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> because also only he has a big sleeves. He's a king. So I make him like uh, have very special clothes. I'm also king, but I have the uh, more simple one. Oh. Also here you can see in our fashion clothes we don't have any button. We created a button at time. We, it's, it's not that we didn't have it, we have it. But it's more common for us to have the ropes here. And also one thing very important is we call this Zhao Lin. So which means it's cross the collar. And also it's important for you to put the left part inside and the right part and then this part on top. We have two minutes. 
One is you are barbarian, or you are a dead person, you are dying. So people die, you put them the other side. So this is very important. So you see the, the traditional clothes in Japan or Korea, basically the, 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 the Korean clothes are from China. So they, they all have the similar, the same. It's like rules. You cannot do it wrong. If you do it wrong, you make a very big mistake. So here, we also use the ropes here. As you can see from the photo, we have really many different types, and also in different dynasties, we have different different ones. And then it's uh, the lower part. Basically, it's one cotton, um, one piece of cotton, and then you go here. It's a very simple and uh, very comfortable wearing the piece. But also, I said it's, uh, we have, you know, uh, why in the movies or in many medias you, you don't see Chinese people? Even I go to China, you can see very few people, no people, basically, few people wearing this. Because it's from in the past 200 years, we lost it. We didn't lose the real thing. We lost the tradition. So, because you know, in China we have many historical events. So, basically, people are trying to learn everything from the West. We we're wearing the suits, we we're wearing the Western clothes, the modern clothes. We basically abandoned our traditions um, and many things. So, especially for the clothes. So, but you know, in China we have 56 minor, uh, we have 55 minorities. One majority is Han Chinese. You have 55 uh, minorities, I mean, small groups of Chinese people. So, but in most of the minorities, they have their traditional clothes. They keep it. But only in Han Chinese, they put Han Chinese people, we lost it. So, this is, so then this makes you, when you go to China, basically you see nobody are wearing traditional clothes. But if you go to Japan, you can still see people wearing the traditional so about 10 years ago in China, only 10 years ago in China, there are a group of, some groups of Chinese young people that started to revive, bring back our traditional clothes. At that time I was in Beijing. So in the beginning when we were wearing the traditional clothes and walking on the street, even Chinese people asking, are you Japanese? Are you Korean? <laughs> even Chinese people, people are asking this. But not today nobody asks, everyone knows. Because in China, there are now more and more young people are, are wearing the traditional clothes, even in the streets, and do many events. And also, for example, in the birth, on the birthday of Confucius, people go to the, his temple to do really the, the rituals. So this becoming really the, the, the traditional culture is bring back. And also five years ago, around five years ago, the central government of China has, a real, has officially announced we are reviving traditional culture. So this is a good thing for China. That's, that's something I really admire Greece. When I came to Greece uh, six years ago, but at that time in China the traditional culture is still very beautiful. Because I, I know in Greece you have keep it, your traditional culture, you have still maintained, especially from in theater, you still have it. I know of course you spend, you also had some chaos period for theater. In, I, I saw from the lecture from Georgina Hafdaki. But I, something compared to China is, is better. But now today, the, the good things we are coming, we are bringing this back. But you know, in the, in the beginning, the period of the, we are bringing it back, we make a mistake. Because many people, especially in ourselves, we didn't know how to really like. You see, you can imagine for more than 100 years, nobody wearing this. How do you know you are making the correct thing? You can only see it from the museums, or the books, or the pictures, like from like in Greece, you see from the pottery. How do you know it's real, it's, it's right, it's correct? So 
So these are some of the efforts we are making in China. Uh, but what, why I use this costume in this project? Because I didn't use this for the real opera performances or the stage performance. I used the real, we call it Han Fu. So you know, Han, we call Han Chinese. So this clothes is for Han Chinese, it's called Han Fu. Fu means clothes. So, this, because I want to really bring the Greek audience to see the real clothes we have, we wear in ancient China. This, this has become very meaningful. Also, it, this is the first time this uh, handful to be in Greece for with so many Greek, especially Greek actors wearing it. And also, I was amazed when they wear wear the costume. Of course, they were very happy. Wow, these beautiful clothes we are wearing. I think no Greek people has wear this. Uh, except the actor for Charlie Hoffman. Otherwise, nobody has wear it before. But what after they wear this? I took the photos of them. I post. I sent to my friends in China. They said, "Wow, we didn't still feel they are very strange or they are foreigners. They're really in the clothes." So that is one thing I, I I was really happy to hear that from the feedback from my Chinese friends, because I was afraid if they wear it, people say, "Oh, they are very strange foreigners wearing Chinese costumes on stage." So this is uh, the costumes really add much value for. And the uh, history, of course. This is one thing I really need to teach them because this project, this, this story happened in 2000, uh, 206 BC to 202 BC, it was more than 2000 years ago. So, even many Chinese people don't know what, what was it like if we don't even know the history. So, uh, we also spend many time. Do many practice the exercises of drama in education to help them to. Like in this part, we are doing a picture uh, exercise. So I show them some pictures from the stories or of the ancient China. Then they imitate it, and then the, the others around they are guessing what they are doing. What 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 was the story? And then they started to do slow motion to improvise based on their understanding what is happening. Because I didn't tell, I didn't tell even these four people what was happening in this image. They were guessing, they were imagining. So then, after they have the slow motion of moving, and then the others guess again. But sometimes, for they are guessing, okay, these three people attacking the other one. But actually, after they start moving, they found two attacking the other one, protecting. So this is a, I'm just give an example. So in this way, they could. Much better understanding of some many stories of respect history. Of course, I also had one very serious that sit around me. I, I tell them the, the history. And uh, this is also one thing I said uh, most interesting is uh, what makes it into cultural theater between China and Greece. So, for example, for the actress, uh, she's uh, the queen of the other side. Uh, so, she she spent really a lot of time to learn the dancing. She has three dances in the performance. And all different. The last, this last one with a sword. In the beginning, I was really worried. It's very difficult for her. And uh, we spent even extra time to do together, to practice. I sent her many videos because also I'm not a, a dancer for Chinese dance. So we don't have teacher of Chinese dance here. This is also something very difficult. I, unfortunately, I know some martial art. I'm a musician. I'm good at literature. I do, I do many things for basically all the Chinese elements are from me. But the dance is too difficult. I cannot dance a, a girl's dance. So, but, the, but I, I keep giving the advices to her, and then we, did, we watched many videos, and then we, but in the end, it's not going to be very, very, very good. So, this is something from our project. So now we come to, we are leaving our my project. So we are coming to the intercultural theater of the Chinese cultural part. You know well Greek culture, so I, I'm not here to, to share in Greek culture with you. So I'm sharing the Chinese culture part, especially how we use the Chinese culture in the intercultural theater. This is something I said. If you want to do a theater, you need to study both cultures. 
and you need to really understand both. Otherwise, we are very easy to make mistakes. Uh, so, Confucius. Huh? And uh, I think Socrates. So, this is these two sentences said by Nikos Kalantakis. So, basically, what he is saying under the, the Greeks and the Chinese people's faces, there is, and the Greek people faces is Chinese, and our faces is Greek. So, we have many similarities. Yes, right, we have many similarities. And also, uh, Kanzakis is really, he really put China, China in a very high position. It's something we really respect. Um, after these years, I have done the culture projects with China and Greece. I have to say, we have many similarities, but also we have many differences. I uh, like now for the virus, we have different mentalities. We should wear masks or we should, we should not wear masks. It's, it's a kind of a fight now. In China, with everyone you need to wear a mask. But here, it's totally different. This is a map I did a photo I took in the group owner's home. He showed me the, a map. This is a map. This is the first map in the world marked China. So you can see this is the whole, whole world. And this is China. And if the name was uh, here. So I, we know in the we have a silk road, so we have a connection in the very early period, especially in the Byzantine period. We have a connection to the silk road, and now say we have more roads. <coughs> but we, why I'm saying I, here, I don't want to share too many about our similarities. I want to share the differences. We are very different. Many, many people don't like to hear this. Yeah, but you know, I have heard in this year I have heard too many times. Oh, our group of Greeks and Chinese people we have very similar. We have many similarities. We are all like people, and we are all relationship oriented. We are we like families, and we blah, 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 blah. we have Asian civilization. Yes, but we are very different. Why? Because from the history and also from our geography. You can see this is a map of. China on the map of Greece. In China, you see, basically it's the land. In Greece, it's the sea. Also, in China, it's very important to notice that since, since Ming Dynasty, that was around 800 years ago, the, the whole empire closed all the coast. Well, we have a saying, we don't let any border, make any wooden border to be the water. It's kind of a crazy idea, but uh, it happened. So, since that time, the, the China and the Greece we have developed in, we start from very, very similar things in the prehistorical period. And then we developed in very different. This is the Han dynasty. Actually, in, my, in the, our the, the play, it's a, it's a contention between Chu and Han, the two countries. And the Chu failed, Han win. And then Han became the Han. Dynasty. So if you, you know something about Chinese history, that is the most important dynasty in China. It unites for the whole China, and also since that time the Chinese people are called Han Chinese. So this is Han, and that time Han, the land is like this. It's this, this big. And, but we know in Greece, you had the real country since 1829. I mean, namely, a country. Before that, they have many policies. So, but in China, since, uh, I think since uh, 600 BC, we started to have the whole country unite. Yeah. But at that time, you have, uh, 500 BC, you have the Athens to be a very strong police. And also, then you have the war between Athens and Sparta. But you are different nations, many, many, many nations. And that's for a very long time. So this, they, the, the two countries are very different. So that's why, for example, in now today, in China, we will have the virus. The whole country can be like a wall. We stop all the people standing at home. It cannot happen in Greece. Right? So this is something making the people's mentality are very different. That's why when the Greek actors perform a play from 200 BC in China, 
They want to understand the mentality from the time. It's too different. So, to make it simple, in China we have agriculture culture. In Greece you have the maritime culture. You are living on the sea. You are living on the land. We we walk on the on the our lands and make the, all the uh, we eat the the weeds. Uh, you are living on the sea. You eat the fish and the seafood. So this is very different. And in the big, very very early period, you are already very advanced in that phase with other uh, people, other other nations. I in China no, we live by ourselves because all the outcomes from the the, the land is enough for us. We have huge land. Even today, we can also live on ourselves. So this is a developed two very different civilizations. So you can see the difference. It's not from today, or I'm just saying, it's from the history. It's actually it's, it's from the root. So when we talk about Chinese culture, um, the first thing I really want to talk about is philosophy. But as you know, Chinese people don't know that philosophy. So in China, if you talk about philosophy, it's very boring. Uh, nobody really likes it. But in Greece, I know philosophy is very important, very very important, and people like it. And you are studying, and also it has becoming very important in your culture. So when we, so I would like to introduce about Chinese philosophy. It's very rare, people. I think in Greece, I have never seen any people here introducing Chinese philosophy here. When we talk about philosophy, many people know Confucius. Yes, we have Confucius. But, you know, Confucius is only one of it. This is from 600 BC, I said, when 600 BC was becoming the one country. And then to 221 BC. We had 189 philosophies. Not philosophers, philosophies. So Confucianism is only one of the 189 philosophies. So we basically, the most, these are the very important ones, the Confucianism, we know, by Kung Tzu. Taoism, not is also one of the very important religions, by Lao Tzu. And here I wrote the real name, his real name is Lao Tang or Yang. Legalism. We had a legalism, you know, the first, uh, the first uh, empire in China is called the Qing. It's becoming an empire because of legalism. They use legalism to rule the whole country. Which means, basically, they, 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 they manage the whole country based on the laws. Everything has laws. You do something wrong, okay, based on the law, you are punished by war. And Mormonism, Mormonism is, is basically about the last days, like the Technology. technology. So at the time we have also many mechanisms are making by the moism. School of minor talks. Basically they are like a boy on the literature. Logicians. This one is very Greek. They're, like, they're talking about the logics. The, uh, what the most of the Greek philosophers always uh, talk. A school of diplomacy. These are the people very important between the modern na the nations to to deal with. For example, oh, I I just with the one king to attack the other king. That's, so we are saying they are like the ancestors of the dark state of diplomacy. And also some others. I don't I don't say all the people. So some people you could know Sun Tzu. It's about the school of the military. Uh, you know yin yang. When you talk about yin yang, they, many of them think yin yang is from Taoism, but actually it was one independent philosophy. Also, we have Chinese medicine. It's also one philosophy. It's almost not only medical. <coughs> so, but things changed from 6th century, especially from Han Dynasty. Okay, the king acted that dynasty. They had a, they did a one thing is they only choose one philosophy to be the ruling philosophy, to be the top one, which is Confucianism. After that, two thousand years, the China has been under the ruling of Confucianism. That's why today most people in the West know about Confucianism, but not the others. That is also one thing we really have a problem. But uh, we don't talk about that, that uh, part today. So 
the day in China. So last year you are awesome lot. You have awesome lot here. But uh, in China we have many religions, but one of the religions. Which means 90% maybe uh, I don't I don't know the data, but uh, about 90% of the Chinese people are not religious. But uh, there are also some people are religious, for example Christians, uh, Buddhists, Taoists, or Muslim. There are also people religious, but not some groups. But today, we don't talk about the religion. We are talking about the philosophy, our mentality, our culture. In China, we have a saying, it's called the San Jiao He Yi, which means the three teachings, harmonious as one. The three teachings, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. These three religions mix together to build up the Chinese culture. So when we talk about Chinese culture, we are not only confusing them. We have all the philosophies from the three, uh, three religions. Um, so if you want to understand Chinese culture, you need to really know this. So when you want to study Chinese culture, you need to study these three religions, and they are now mixing together in Chinese mentality. For example, my parents, are not, uh, they are not religious. They don't even know Confucius, actually. They don't know, maybe. But they don't know anything from, about him, from him. They know some thoughts from Taoism. Um, Chinese mythology is based on Taoism. Our old gods are from Taoism. Buddhism is from India, but now it's purely Chinese. For example, my parents are not religious. They know something from Confucius. Them. But, for example, they, they, they asked me to study very hard to, to, to go to a very good university, to, to become a good student. That's based on confusion with them. Also, in, all, in many traditional festivals, they also do the ceremonies for the gods. This is from Taoism. We have also the number like the place of the, of the gods at home. It's, it's based, for example, in Chinese New Year, they do this. Also, we have the Buddha. The statue at home. They, my parents they also created the Buddha. For example, when I know when I had the, my examination for the entry to the university after high school, we had graduated from the high school. My parents, after that, I, I knew they pray at home. They do many ceremonies to the to the Buddha, to the gods. Oh, please let them know go to a good university, have good exams. They do this, but they are not religious. So there's something deeply in the Chinese people's mind, but they don't consider it as religion. So you need to really understand it. For example, here if you say you are if you are Christian, of course you do the ceremonies in the, in the churches. But if you are not, maybe you don't go there. It's very clear. But in China it's not clear. It's mixing. Like my parents, they also go to the temples. Even we also go to the temples. Ah, we go to the the Buddhists or the, or the gods. We also do the ceremonies. So this is some. So not only for my parents, it's for, for most of Chinese people. And also now we come to the arts. The most of four important Chinese arts is built up all the Chinese culture, which is called the Qing, Qi, Shu, Hua. Qing is a music. Qi is a chess. You know we have a Chinese chess. Actually, you could know the Chinese chess. In Chinese chess, there is also a border in the center, which is called the Chu He Han Jie, which means the border of Chu and Han is from the, um, our play, the story. And the calligraphy, called Shu, right in Chinese, it's also an art, also painting, Chinese painting. These four arts in ancient China, basically, we, we consider all the Chinese scholars must know how to do this for. They need to know all the four arts. Not that like they, they if I'm very good at Qin music, okay, I'm a musician, that's enough. Maybe I don't know how to play chess, I don't know how to play calligraphy. But in ancient China, it's not enough. You need to know everything. So for example, Confucius, he's good at all of this. And he is also a musician, playing Qin. So for you, I have also a video here to let you. It's a it's a, it's a it's project by my friend in China. And it's a very nice video. And you can see it's 
from Han Dynasty. You can see the scene from Han Dynasty. The costumes, the music, the instruments, calligraphy, many elements. So 
this is also one thing uh, we are also trying to collaborate with Greek poetry. So last year we had a concert in Athens, which is called the Greek Chinese Poetry Concert. So we have the two Chinese po poems and Greek poems to match with each other, and then we compose the song, the music, and to play. So this is something we are having all the doing. So Chinese opera. I also have one to show you. To show you. It's, uh, it's not a big opera. It's a big opera. Very different styles, especially this one. Um, 
it's kind of a culture of confidence at that time, because at that time China is, is very strong. So it's becoming uh, more, but at that then it becomes different. Since here, it suddenly changed. So we've been becoming more conservative. The car covering basically all the whole body. Here they can they can uh, put like the chest or the arms outside. The upper here is not allowed. You will consider rule to do that. And then you can see it's changing, changing, changing. And uh, when we say uh, Japanese culture and, and, uh, and the Korean culture, you can have the reference to the different dynasties. Japanese culture you can refer to the Han Dynasty. Because at the time in Han Dynasty, Japan sent many people, like a monks, or the people to China to study Chinese culture. In China, in the history, they call Qian Tang Shi, means the ambassadors sent him to Tang Dynasty. The Koreans are different. They were sent to China at this time. It's called Ming Dynasty. So you can see the, the, the Ming Dynasty, the, the, the clothes are more like in Korean today. So they keep it from the time. So basically we have Han, Tang, uh, uh, Han, Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming, Qing, and then it's becoming to the Republic of China. So the, the clothes becoming changed as it is. So it's becoming more Western. And then today we have the modern clothes. So you can see the changing of all the costumes. But also this is a typical one. But in every dynasty they have different types. So that's why I wanted to say when we talk about Chinese costumes, even not the Chinese culture, only costumes, we have many different costumes. You need to say which history period and then which type for whom. But you have different identities, you have you should wear different clothes. Different clothes? Yeah. Depending on the status, uh, yeah, depending on your roles in the society, mm -hmm. what the job you do, what, uh, yeah, what is the role. Okay, so you have much of Chinese history. Yeah, so the Chinese history is basically divided into three parts. Uh, the Chinese history is divided into three parts. 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 To have the movement and gesture of the Chinese culture, Chinese people. Uh, but also, when we talk about China, martial art, we also, because I know there are many martial art schools here in Greece. Yongfen, Tsai Li Fu, and in Fugaro, like weeks ago, there was like a competition there. Yeah, so we, we uh, these are very helpful, but also we need to know uh, when. When we use the martial arts in different cultural pieces of performances, we need to identify which one is most suitable. Like in this one, definitely Tai Chi is most suitable because they have very many slow movements and you make you more soft. And also it depends on for who, you for Greek people, or for British people, or for Danish people, or Germans, you I think we should use different kind of martial art or dances to help. Because for Greek people, Oh, too free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you need to uh, something like to uh, tie it in there. Okay, so uh, we have many, many things to, to share. Uh, because today the subject is of Chinese culture, it's in the culture of theater. So, for example, from the from opera we have seen, we, there are many things the makeups, the decorations, the costumes, the movements, the gesture of hands. The, the, the fans, all the things they have in the hand, or even, even the architecture. There are many elements you can see from one thing, even as we are talking the opera, you can see many things from there. So these are the things we, we are trying to do the in the culture theatre. For example here, we have the many things, the architecture, the crafts, we have Chinese tea, vegetables, food, and many, 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 many things. So I hope in future, when you are saying Chinese culture, so not, not only one culture, it's many, many, many elements. But what, are, what, what is supporting these all the elements? The philosophy, if you remember, the three religions, they combine to be one. Then it's a supporting. So it's a, I always give like example that it's like a house here. The, all the elements here are like the bricks or the columns. They are, con they are constructing all the houses. But what is the ground? The philosophy. This is the thing, 
the foreign actors, like group actors, the most difficult thing for them to understand or for them to ground. They can easily wear a costume. They can even easily to learn to speak Chinese. They can easily to learn martial art. They can easily even write in Chinese. <coughs> they can easily to play a Chinese uh, instrument, to play drums. But it's difficult for them to understand the philosophy of the mentality. That's the thing. So, that is why, as the, in the previous, there, there have been so many practices for intercultural the theatre by European directors or Asian directors. But most of the focus are still on the forms. I mean, the forms are about the elements. But in my project, I think this, we, we are becoming more focusing on the actors, on the mentality. And of course, in, in tomorrow, in my defense, my conclusion is drama education is helpful <laughs> for improving the cultural understanding of actors. So, but to make a conclusion for today's uh, lecture, how we should do the intercultural theater from my research, what I understand is we should dis deconstruct the elements of both cultures. For example, Chinese culture, group culture. We it's like a, the whole house, we take off all the bricks of the house from the culture. And then we study, we learn it, we understand it, and then we reconstruct together. That's how we do it. This is also one thing I learned, I heard the same saying from Ross Daly in Greek about the music exchange. He said the same thing, but this is also you might understand. But in this way, you are creating something new. When you really mix, for example, I, choose, I use the, the skins, the bones, the blood from a Greek people, person. And then I choose some other elements from a Chinese people. I mix it together. Is it Greek or Chinese? Both. Or neither. So this is, a, this is something I learned from intercultural theater. So we, I think in my next, next uh, the, the research in the future, I think I will continue in this way. And also, that's, this is also what, something I want to share. Today, I, I do both. I share the Chinese culture. Also, I share how we do the intercultural theater, especially as we take example of Chinese culture and Greek culture. And also, the case is the Andio uh, So, I think only artists has watched the performance. I know. So, I hope maybe we will have another performance in the summer, uh, maybe in Anxi Messini, we are trying. Yes. Yeah, so if there, I uh, hope you can try to, to watch the performance. Maybe with the test lecture, you can understand better what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so this is today's, I think this is the last one. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.